Welcome to our government screencast on how a bill becomes a law. If you take a look at the picture here is uh, the health care bill known as Obamacare. And you notice how huge that is. And one of the questions we're going to get at today is how does Congress, whose job it is to write the laws, handle uh, getting bills like this? And as we mentioned earlier, they get approximately 10,000 bills per year. Um, and many of them not the length of this, but also uh, still to some extent they're, they're long bills and they take a lot of time to read. So how do they handle all this? So um, go quickly about that process. Um, imagine you're walking down the road and you see this image and you wonder to yourself, um, how is it that bears can ride in taxis without seat belts on? And you think to yourself, I have an idea. I think bears ought to wear seat belts. So you are a constituent, which means you are a citizen that is represented by the government and let's say you live in Edina, and here's a map of Edina. If you live in the red area, you are a constituent that is represented in the House of Representatives by Keith Ellison. If you live in the blue area, you live in District 3, and you're represented by Eric Paulson. So depending on where you live, you could call one of these two men, and they would introduce this bill into the House of Representatives for you. Or you could get a hold of one of these two people, Al Franken on the right and Amy Klobuchar on the left, who are senators and represent our state. Uh, between these people, the easiest to get a hold of would be House members because they represent a district, which is significantly less people than a state. So let's imagine that you live right in this area down here, right, and you decide then that you're going to call Eric Paulson. So you call him up and say, Eric, I think we ought to write a bill that says bears have to wear seatbelts. And he agrees, so he writes it, he sponsors it, and, uh, and, and, and introduces it into the House of Representatives. And here is that bill. Notice that it's called HR 210, House of Representatives, and it's given a number based on the order in which it's introduced into the House. If it had started in the Senate, it would be known as S 210. Right? So Eric Paulson is named the speaker, or excuse me, named the sponsor of the bill, and the people up here in this picture behind him might be co-sponsors. And the more co-sponsors a bill has, that it illustrates that it has more support and therefore is most more likely to pass through Congress. So now that our bill has been introduced, it goes into the House. Right? And um, notice bills like this, like we said earlier, are massive, and there are 435 members in the House. Many people, they don't want to read all the bills that get introduced. Otherwise, they would look like this lady with all the paper behind her, um, unable to manage all of it. So how, do, uh, how does Congress handle all these bills? They send them to committees, right, known as standing committees, which instead of being 435 House members, is about 20 House members. Okay? And standing committees um, are permanent committees. They specialize in certain areas. For instance, they might specialize in energy, in foreign relations, in the environment, in uh, labor in the workforce, education, the military. Right? They're specialists, and they become experts on the bills that they're reading and learning about. In the House, there are about 20 uh, standing committees. And in the Senate, there are, almost, there are about 16. So let's imagine that this is the Standing Committee on Transportation. So my bill about bears wearing seatbelts goes to the Transportation Committee. Oftentimes they don't want to read it, though, because they realize that it's not likely to become a law. So they will send it to a subcommittee, which is five members from this Standing Committee, and their job is to research and report on this bill. And here you see in this picture them holding a hearing where they're listening to testimony about whether the bill is a good or bad idea. So once they research and report on the bill, they now send it back to that standing committee of 20 members, the Transportation Committee, with a report on whether it's a good or bad bill. The standing committee now will read that bill, and they'll read that report. They'll debate. They'll revise the bill and maybe add amendments, which is known as a markup session. And then finally, they'll vote on the bill. If they vote yes, the bill will go on. If they vote no, it will die. Or they could table the bill indefinitely, which means leave it um, and research or look at it later, which oftentimes results in a bill dying a slow death. Now, maybe, uh, now you would be thinking that after the standing committee, now it would go back to the House, but that is wrong. In the House of Representatives, there's another committee that the bill has to go to called the Rules Committee, right? And the Rules Committee's job is to decide how uh, much debate can happen about this bill. In an open debate, people can talk for an extended amount of time. In a closed debate, it's very limited. They can also decide if amendments are going to be allowed or not onto this bill. The reason the House has a Rules Committee is because there are 435 members and they need organization in order to be able to let everyone speak their piece and not have endless debates. So 
after the bill goes through the rules committee and is given specific rules now it finally goes to the house for what is called floor action where the bill would be read debated revised and then voted on but if you look at the picture here they would not be voted on right now because as you can see there's no one in the house of representatives there has to be a minimum number of people present in order for there to be a vote that word that you should know is a quorum and right now in this photo there's not a quorum there's not a minimum number needed the quorum for the house of representatives is that half of the members must be there which is 218 and for the senate there have to be at least 50 to 51 people present in order for a vote to take place so now that the 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 there's a quorum in the house the uh, the bill is again read and possibly debated more amendments are read and it's voted on finally if uh, 218 members which is a majority of the house vote yes then the bill moves on if they vote no the bill would die so now it gets to go to the senate and if we take a look at the senate this cartoon illustrates that it is much much tougher for a bill to get through the senate than the house here you see a knight that is representing Obamacare who just went through the house and said well that wasn't so bad and little does he know behind him is the Senate which is a Tyrannosaurus Rex and ready to take him out the reason that this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex the Senate is because it's much slower and harder for bill for bills to get through the Senate this newspaper article um, illustrates that it says 290 house bills waiting for Senate approval there are hundreds of bills sitting outside the Senate waiting uh, that the House is approved but the Senate is slow and not and hasn't gotten to them yet so once it enters the Senate the bill will do all the committee things again that we talked about in the House with standing committees and subcommittees and finally it would reach the Senate floor where for floor action where there are a hundred members now the difference between the Senate and the House is that there are no rules on debate in the Senate someone can talk as long as they want to and this brings about um, after they read, debate, revise, they can, they can filibuster, which basically means they can talk endlessly with the goal of trying to delay the vote on a bill, therefore um, not allowing a bill to pass. The only way a filibuster can be ended, oh, in, excuse me, I have this picture. This is Strom Thurmond, who's a senator from the South during the Civil Rights era, and he once filibustered for 23 straight hours to try and stop a bill that would um, end uh, segregation. Right, and the only way a filibuster can be broken is by voting for cloture, uh, which requires 60 of the 100 senators to vote to end the filibuster, and they therefore can move on and vote on the bill and make a decision if it should pass or die. If you look at this chart here, this chart illustrates the number of times that cloture has been voted for in the past. And as you can see, there's a growing trend where filibusters are being used more and more and more in the Senate, uh, illustrating how Democrats and Republicans are becoming more and more divided, and therefore, uh, it's slowing the Senate down a great deal. So filibusters have become very controversial, and we'll talk more about that later on in this unit as well. And that's why, as we said earlier, the, the Senate would represent is represented as a Tyrannosaurus Rex in this cartoon showing how difficult it is to get past the Senate. So uh, now you would be thinking that maybe it would go on to the President, and if the House and Senate pass the same version of the bill, it would, but let's imagine that they pass different versions. Let's say the Senate adds an amendment that the House did not have, so now the bills are different. Now, if they're different, they have to go to what's called a conference committee. And in a conference committee, their job, it's House members and senators come together and iron out the differences between the House and the Senate. For instance, um, they would debate, they would talk about the amendments that have been added and which ones should go on the bill, and ultimately the, words, the, the, the bill and the words in the bill would be exactly the same. And then it is once again passed back to the House and back to the Senate for a final approval, which, by the way, in the Senate, it could be filibustered again here, again, slowing the process down. But once both chambers approve this compromised bill, it is then sent to the president for what we call executive action. And the president can do three things. He can sign the bill, and it becomes a law, which is most often what happens. He can veto the bill, and then it would have to start again with the House, and this time it would require a two-thirds majority to vote yes in order to pass the House and the Senate. Or he can just wait 10 days and ignore the bill. And if he ignores the bill and Congress adjourns or leaves and goes home, ends their session, the bill would die, and that's known as a pocket veto. One of Barack Obama's vetoes in his first four years in office was a pocket veto. If Congress stays in session and he doesn't sign the law and waits 10 days, then it becomes a law without the President's signature. 
So let's imagine that the president signs this bill about bears wearing seatbelts, and now we have bears wearing seatbelts, which thank goodness because it would be dangerous if this bear got out. At the end of the day, though, this, isn't still, this law still isn't safe. If someone decides it's not a fair law or not constitutional and they sue the government, that could go to the Supreme Court where they would be able to strike down that law using what's called judicial review and decide that it, it, it's not appropriate and the legislative branch would either need to fix it or it would be totally scrapped. So this is the life of a bill. Um, and if you have any questions, bring those to class. Hopefully you can understand this, pause it and take notes and go back and understand these processes. This is very important for this unit and we'll be discussing it much more in class. Thanks.